Well, Tom, I am so honored to have you on my podcast today. Well, Shilpa, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to our talk today. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, you and I have been chatting before I hit record, and clearly we have a passion for meditation. Indeed. Today's topic is around mindfulness, but going deeper into crafting your presence through soulful storytelling. And as we both know, as a solopreneur, a lot of our um, passion comes from connecting with others. And then through our podcast, we enlist stories that can inspire the solopreneur in all of us. So having said that, maybe stepping back, share with the audience your story of how you arrived in the space. Well, thank you for... Uh giving me that opportunity because uh, my listeners obviously have heard it many, many times, but uh, this is good because I've got a new audience to uh, hopefully not bore, but uh, <laughs> inspire and enlighten. So I was working for Fidelity Investments for about 11 years uh, doing payroll number crunching. So you're not the only, uh, you're, you're not the only nerd. <laughs> so uh, it was a busy time of year. I think it was, I think it was, must've been fall. The more I think about it, it must've been fall. And uh, I went in on a Sunday because I'm like, I am so behind. I got to get some stuff caught up. I was the only one in the office, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, so I'm doing my work. And uh, at this time, I mean, I've been meditating for over 40 years. So I've got a pretty uh, heavy connection to my higher self, to, to source, to my guides. So I was meditating, or not meditating, I was working. And then I got done with my work. And like in my head, I'm thinking, I'm like, Okay, am I ready to go? Uh, I'm asking myself this question. And I was asking myself that question from a work standpoint uh, about did I do all the things? Am I caught up? And in my head, I heard my guide, uh, Bart Bartholomew, say, "You are done." And then I stopped, and I'm like, "You're not talking about today, are you?" He's like, "Nope." He's like, "It's time." Do you feel it? I said, "Yeah, I do feel it." So I went into a conference room. I meditated for another half an hour, uh, came back out, went back to my computer, wrote up my letter of resignation to my uh, vice president, said, thank you so much for this opportunity. I've been here 10 years and I've enjoyed almost every day of it. <laughs> uh, but now the time has come for me to move on to what I'm really supposed to do. So uh, with that, put it under the door and just walked out into the day. And I'm like, OK, here we go new chapter. Yikes. <laughs> but it wasn't that much yikes as it was. I'm like, wow. It's like my soul just blossomed. And it's just like, wow, wow. I took that step. And uh, I'm like, I don't know what the future holds, but I know it's where I'm supposed to be. So, and I've, because of my meditation practice, I've always felt that. I've always felt like I am always safe. I am always protected and I always have enough. It's been that way since day one and it'll be that way till day <laughs> the last day. So uh, I just felt leaving the day uh, office that day, just so enervated and so excited. So, so that's how I got it started into all this. And um, I'm super curious that what was your initial catalyst for meditation? Meaning how did you become a practitioner? I realized that that's not the only thing we're talking about today, but I, I am, right. I always love to learn about this part. Well, I have another story that my listeners have heard many times. And that is when I was 18 years old, uh, back in 1982, whew, I can't even believe I've been around on this planet for that long, but that's another story. <laughs> but anyway, my mom was incredibly progressive. Uh, so she, along with two other people taught meditation to people in the, in the neighborhood, uh, in, in the town. And each Tuesday, they would get together. We had a, my mom had a business in the house. So she had, we had a larger house and in the front, they'd all get together and uh, talk about meditation. And I remember the first time it started, I, I was asking my mom, like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, do you have a, a, meet, a business meeting tonight? She's like, no, I'm just getting together with some friends. We're going to talk about meditation. And at this point, I didn't even know what meditation was. So, uh, but she was getting ready a whole bunch of snacks. And I'm like, oh, not, not only the snacks, I'm like, snacks. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, can I join? She's like, uh, why don't we wait a little bit, sweetheart? And for whatever reason, I don't know why she uh, was hesitant. But anyway, but I was so curious. So uh, I had my 
ear to the door, pretty much just I'm like, wow, this is fascinating hearing about all the things they're talking about. And it wasn't like a next week or a couple of weeks. It was like, it's probably like a year that my mom uh, eventually said, do you want to join us? So I think it was 17 when I, when they started and it was 18 when, uh, when I was joined. So one day my mom said, do you want to join us, sweetheart? I'm like, are you kidding me? You're kidding me. You're not just like, you're not just psyching me out. <laughs> I'm like, yes, absolutely. So that was the start of my meditation uh, journey, uh, learning meditation. Uh, so we met every Friday, no, every Tuesday. Uh, and that was it. And then I'd meditate on Tuesdays and Saturdays. That was all I could fit in way back in the day before I had a, con a consistent practice. Uh, but one of the things I tell uh, listeners is that for the longest time, I practice wasn't that consistent. I was, I meditate those two days because I just learned. I didn't even know that there's any value to uh, consistency. I didn't even know that people did it every day. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. But I remember going away to college and uh, it was like a, a Thursday. And I don't know if it was finals or something came up and I was homesick and I was finals and I was like stressed. And I'm like, oh, I cannot wait until Saturday when I can meditate. And then, <laughs> and then uh, thankfully, uh, my guide said, uh, you, you know, you don't have to wait until Saturday, right? I'm like, okay, I'm a very learned man, but I didn't even think about that. <laughs> so I made a beeline to the chapel and uh, just uh, hunkered down and meditated. And uh, that was the beginning of my consistent practice uh, every day. So, so that's how I started. That's how I continued. So that is lovely. And you and I, before I hit record, I use the word non-negotiable. Like for me, meditation is deeply who I am and it is my source of peace. Hmm. And so, Indeed. Even if things are going well, it doesn't mean I won't meditate. So perhaps you can share your philosophy around how it has affected you or, you know, just helped you in life. Well, that's a very broad question, but I will try and give it the Reader's Digest version so uh, we don't go on for seven hours. But uh, <laughs> to that question, much like you, my meditation practice just brings me unparalleled peace. Um and we talked about this before we got on the air, too, that uh, I strive for and hit it most days of 20 minutes in the uh, in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening. But there are days when things come up. Does that mean I stop meditating or don't meditate? I'm like, no, not by a long shot. Uh, much like you, it's a non-negotiable. Much like I tell my students, if you don't have time, first of all, assess if you truly don't have time or you're buying into societal beliefs that you don't have time. And then the other thing is, uh, if you truly don't have time, you have a minute, you have two minutes and two minutes of meditating is worth, uh, is, has, is pretty much priceless. You don't have to do it for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. I mean, one of the things we talked about too is social media, how that kind of sways how we think. And if you're a new meditator, one of the things I tell my students is like, don't compare yourself to anybody on social media. I mean, we, you shouldn't in, in any fashion anyway, <laughs> but when it comes to meditation, when you hear somebody say, oh, I meditated, for, I had a great meditation for an hour. I'm like, just say, good for you and do whatever you need to do for you. So that, you know, our society says, uh, be the best, you know, try and keep up with the Joneses. That's not meditation at all. So when I tell them, you have two minutes a day, so keep your practice going, keep it consistent and meditate every day, whether it be two minutes or 20 minutes. So that's, uh, that's one thing that helps me when those busy times come. But there have been so many instances, obviously, with 40 years of meditating, where uh, I've had meditations that were just sublime and just totally surreal and not really questioning uh, the nature of reality, much more enlightening and showing me things. And I'm like, oh, wow, I don't know if I knew that before. I'm like, I know I didn't know that before. Thanks, guys <laughs> and gals, energies uh, for showing me things, a connection to all life, uh, compassion against, uh, you know, across large divides of, uh, space and time. But yeah, so those are, those are the moments that I love in my meditation. Just the times where I experience something that I've never experienced before. And that, uh, at 60 years old, uh, I love that that's still happening. <laughs> and your energy clearly to me reflects that you are reaping the benefits of such a practice and it's it's remarkable I, I like hearing the fact that you were gravitated to it from a young age 
Mm. Um, can you share, this is more of my own curiosity, um, when you say guides, is this more intuitive and how does that help you? Because I truly believe in that. I just mm -hmm. want others to understand what, what that feels like or what it means. Yeah, sure. It's, it's amazing because my guides come in all uh, different varieties, but the one that I've had since 18 is uh, Bartholomew. And uh, as he mentions it, and I've come to know, obviously, through the decades, is that he is an aspect of my higher self, uh, my connection to source. So uh, even though he was uh, had a physical form hundreds of years ago, obviously is transcendent humanness and now is uh, an aspect of me that's connected to me that gives me guidance um, when I ask for it, when I don't ask for it. <laughs> so um, many times uh, I, I'll hear his voice in my meditations um, and many times in my waking days as, as well. And uh, my mom, who passed away about seven years ago, uh, when she passed away, I don't know why I didn't think about this, that uh, I thought for sure, I'm like, well, my mom's gone. That's that's it. She's dead. She's gone. And I'll never be able to talk to her again, avail myself to her wisdom, her unconditional love. So for a year and a half, uh, as I grieved, I was like, wow, that really stinks. And then in a meditation, I heard her voice. And uh, I said, uh, mom, is that you or am I going crazy? Do I miss you that much that I'm I'm putting these thoughts in my head, hearing your voices in my head? She's like, what does your intuition say? I said, my, my gut says that it's you. I'm like, but I don't know how that it's possible. She's like, do you think it's true? I said, yes, 100%. Do you need to know? I'd like to, but I don't need to, no. And we've gone on to have many conversations to which uh, yeah, it's like, oh, just beautiful. <laughs> For those who are watching the video of this podcast, I am not crying, although I am very touched by that story. <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, I lost my mom and I have a hard time reconciling those emotions and spirituality altogether. I still yeah. haven't figured out because on one hand, I believe in the soul and the energy and everything. And yet when it comes to the logic of losing somebody you deeply love, it's just hard to reconcile. It is. And as I came to understand it or not understand it, but as my mom tried to uh, explain it to me, she said, sweetheart, you of all people know that time is not linear, that past, present and future are all happening at the same time. In this moment, there's an aspect of me that is left human form, but that energy is still part of who you are, of who I am. There's another aspect of me that is still alive in another time. And it shifts between time. So you are talking to or communicating with an aspect of me that is both gone and here uh, and from the past. So I'm like, mom, that hurts my brain. She's like, then don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think if you and I will have to go in on a deeper discussion just on that, Indeed. Uh, that topic alone. I have plenty to say now. The art, overarching theme for this one is about being present, and you've touched upon it already, but I feel like we live in a society where really truly being present is an esoteric concept at times. Maybe you can share your wisdom around this and the techniques that you offer to your clients on how to get present or be present. Well, you bring up a good point. It's not... Uh... It's almost an aberration for people in our society to sit still, to uh, to be in this moment. Uh, as we talked about before we got on the air, our society is always saying, you need to validate your life every second of every day. That means you need to produce. That means you need to move. That means you need to start knowing nothing and then go to a point where you know everything. And as you and I both know, that is not meditation at all <laughs> in any stretch of the imagination. So our society, and I tell my students this all the time, our society says that you shouldn't meditate, that you shouldn't sit still, that you should, because you're either being lazy, selfish, and, and obviously those things are the farthest thing from the truth. But our society is always telling us the minute we wake up, move, 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 move. And whether that be thinking about the future, and which is another aspect of our society, you got to have goals, you got to have dreams, you got to have uh, start from point A, get to point Z. 
So we're constantly being told to think into the future. We're constantly being told to move. So you are absolutely right that to sit in stillness, to become mindful and aware of this moment and this moment only goes against all that our society tells us. So for people that do take the time to be mindful, kudos, you are no sheep. <laughs> You're saying that might work for somebody else, but not for me. I need time to sit in stillness and reflect. And for me, I'd say, I mean, I've always been relatively mind, uh, mindful, uh, but I love how probably in the past decade, it has probably become even greater, meaning that each morning when I wake up, uh, I go for a walk through the woods and I end up at the bleachers at the university uh, where I meditate. But my walk there is what I call a no thought zone, meaning that I don't get to think about the to-do list. I don't have to, or don't get to think about marketing the podcast. Think, you know, I'm like, my goal is to, and my guides keep me very well grounded in this to say, just walk, just be here in everything. And it's just amazing how so many times in my walk, I just stop my, uh, my higher self, my intuition says, stop. Many times we, you know, we'll be in our days, we look up the sky, I'm like, maybe it's dusk or dawn. We're like, oh man, that's beautiful. Okay, cool. Got to go. Got to get to work. Where in my days, I'm like, that's not me anymore. I'm not nine to five. If I want to stop and look at the sun for 10 minutes, I can do that. And uh, with that awareness, with that mindful um, presence, everything just becomes so alive. There's, I noticed things that I never would have noticed before way back in the day uh, because I've kind of taught myself or become aware of the, the gift of mindfulness that our entire world is just so beautiful, but it becomes so invisible to so many people because their minds are so far in the future that everything here in this moment now is gone because they're like, they're just so like, I got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do that. And they're like, do you see that bird over there? That woodpecker just like burrowing into that tree. How cool is that? <laughs> I'm like, look at that squirrel. <laughs> so yeah, mindfulness has definitely aided me many times over. And it truly sounds like you have been honed in on the ability to be present. Mm -hmm. Like just the details you provided of nature and your observation we do live in a society and I, I'm guilty of having lived that style most of my life. Yeah, where, me too. You know, like you get up, you go to work and like and I, in the beginning days when I started to make my meditation even more of a process that is a non-negotiable, mm -hmm. the back of my mind, I'd be like, well, gosh, you're being lazy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and thankfully, but, that's not your higher self talking. That's society talking for sure. Society talking. And, you know, the other day, and I'll send you the picture. My son and I were driving home after one of his games. And I said, you know, let's turn around and go to the edge of the neighborhood. That you can see a little bit of the ocean from there. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And we got there and I'm like, look at the scarlet colors emanating from everywhere. Like it, it was like this mind blowing view of the sky and i just sit there took a picture and i send it to my iphone because every morning i have a list of gratitudes so nice. now i look at that picture as part of my gratitude i'm like i think i'm getting better at being a more spiritually evolved soul now that i'm being more present yeah oh absolutely absolutely and i love how you uh shared that part of your gratitude practice with us and with listeners uh because it's definitely part of the mindful uh, it's a definitely a mindful piece because one of the things we know, or maybe, maybe people might not know, there, there's what's called the RAS, the reticular activating system. And it's the kind of like the stopgap for our brain. If we paid attention to literally everything, our brains couldn't handle it. So our brain says, okay, this means something to you. So I'm going to point that out in your environment. Um, so, and that works in a negative way, in a positive way. If we are thinking like, I don't have enough money or things are tight. If that becomes our belief system, mm -hmm. then our RAS say, oh, that's what you believe. Let me show you more things that reinforce that. But to a gratitude practice, it's the exact opposite. It's like, you know what? Look at that sky. 
what a gift that is. And our brain says, cool. You like that? Check out that. I'm like, whoa, sweet. And your brain just kind of guides you, your intuition, your gut, your soul, your brain guides you to things that are important to you. So when you have a gratitude practice, it says, I have enough. I am thankful. Then the universe and your brain work in concert to say, cool. If that's what you think, let's give you more of that. So I love that. Yeah. I'm glad that you brought up the science part of it. Because for me, the science and the spirituality, they are very much intertwined. I do, do believe that it's not woohoo. The, right. The stuff. And so I, I, I'm glad you brought up the fact that, what did you call it? R, R, T the oh. RAS, the reticular activating system. <laughs> okay, reticular activating system. That is very scientific. That is Indeed. grounded. However, I on the other element of the woohoo side, which I often do believe in as well now more Me and too. more, you know, I believe that we're all energetic beings and as pure energy, that which we focus on, we attract. Indeed. And so like I go above and beyond this gratitude list. Like it I make myself read it, look at it, add to it. Nice. And then what happens is you start paying attention to those little things, like you were saying, and you're attracting more of it. Yeah, exactly. And it's wonderful. I think many times people think about a gratitude list, maybe if they're not as spiritual or they're just starting out, no judgment, but they're thinking like, well, nothing happened to me today. I didn't win the lottery. I didn't get a, I didn't get that job that I was uh, in line for. I'm like, so there's nothing to be grateful for today. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, maybe just tweak your thinking just a little bit to see that for the past five days, it's been raining. And now today, the sun is shining. I'm like, that's a gift. That's something to be grateful for. So it's not massive, massive things that are totally me driven. <laughs> it's totally like, just be thankful for waking up for the world that we live in. Uh, and so, yeah, I love the fact that you bring up the, the fact that it doesn't need to be massive things. It's everything, the sun on your face, the job that you get, the food on your table, uh, the people that smile at you in the supermarket. I'm like, ah, oh, God, life is good. <laughs> Absolutely. And that goes back to being present. Mm. You, you are consciously making a choice to observe, acknowledge, and then feel gratitude. And then, you know, what happens is my first thing on my list for my gratitude is I'm grateful for everything. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yep. For me, there are some things I always have to kind of like, I'm grateful for them all the time, like my family, my friends. Uh, and I'm like, okay, guys, you know, I love you. You're on the list, but I want to broaden things. I'm like, cool. The the stream uh, that's frozen over that I could see the sun reflected in. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Uh, just little things. So yeah. to your point, sometimes I have to make sure I'm like, okay, Mom, dad, brothers, friends, cool. You're in there. I didn't write it down, but you're there. <laughs> now, as a person who is also focused, not just on the spirituality part, but also serving those who are what, what I call the solopreneurs, it's, it's a journey that can be very lonely. Mm. And one of the things that I personally struggle with, so I'm sure the others who don't even have a meditation practice may struggle more, is being aware that it is a journey and that the, the end result or the event isn't the goal. But, right, right. You know, and that's just a very challenging thing because then it requires for you to be, again, present. Maybe right. you can share a little bit about your journey as a solopreneur and how you've um, manage these emotions, so to speak. For me, one of the things that's most important is understanding, excuse me, when I need to be with people and when I don't. I mean, this is just like you. This is my office and I'm here alone <laughs> all day. But as, uh, as we'll probably say for another topic, I am never alone at any time of the day. I am connected to all life, but we'll save that for another time. But to your point, there are times that I'm here and, uh, I mean, I'm a very introspective guy, but I tell my dad all the time, I'm like, I am the perfect blend of you and mom because my dad is kind of quiet and he keeps to himself and my mom could talk to and does or did talk to strangers all the time. So I tell my dad, I'm like, there are times I'm like, I just want to be alone. and I just want to be introspective. I want to work. And then there are times I'm here and I'm like, okay, I got to get out of this place. I got to see people. I got to see smiles. I got to see life. Uh, so part of that is knowing the balance. 
when to take breaks, when not to take breaks. In regards to the overall journey, it's just for me, and maybe it's for you, and correct me if I'm wrong, I have a feeling it is, but for most of my life, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I was good at, at many things, and you know, I've done many things in my life. But when I woke up in the morning, it's like, time to go to work. Never. It's like, um, work. Sweet. Uh, now, when I wake up, I'm like, it's just like, I can't believe that for decades, I was, I don't want to say aimless, because I had jobs, obviously, and I did stuff, and I contributed in many different ways, but nothing really pulled me like meditation does and teaching meditation. So one thing that definitely helps me as a, uh, as a solopreneur is understanding my why and meditation is definitely it. So when I get up in the morning, it's like, not like oh, I have to, it's like, Oh, sweet. Another day, another day where I can bring light and joy and love to the world. I'm like, that's me. That is me. So how am I going to do that? So that knowledge of why I'm here and knowing that I'm supposed to be here, that fuels me more than anything. So having balance to get out and see people, but knowing why I'm here. And if there's ever a time that I might not be, quote, as productive uh, as society says I should be, um, then I really just reconnect. I, I meditate, to be honest with you. So if, if, it's, if things seem off during the day, uh, which as a default or as a, an exception might happen, I'm like, I'm not behind a desk anymore. I don't have to say, hey, I'm going out for uh, for lunch, an early lunch. I'm like, I go to my chair and I just meditate. And I'm like, that'll either just center myself or I'll ask. I'm like, what's off today? And sometimes I'll get an answer. Sometimes I won't, but that's the intention. But nine times out of 10, it's just a reset. I'm like, okay, cool. And one of the other things that's very pivotal for me is at the risk of sounding... Um, well, at the risk of trying to be as humble as possible in my meditations, uh, sometimes it's stronger, sometimes it's not as strong. I have the ability to sense the energy of the planet. Uh, and sometimes uh, when I put my feelers out there, I'm like, it's a good day for the world. Cool. Other days, I'm like, oh, I feel a lot of pain out in the world today. I'm like, okay, I am one man who can help, hopefully, one person feel less pain in this world, to feel more joy, to connect more with what means something to them. So those things keep me going. So I'm never, I'm never like, huh, I'm, I'm at a loss for what to do. I'm like, no, it's, <laughs> it's oh, that uh, I always know what I'm supposed to do, but there are days I'm like, oh, I'm tired or maybe I'm a little off, but my meditation will always get me back on. And again, uh, when I just think about even just one person, if there's one person out in the world whose life I could change. Uh, and it's not that I'm a guru or something like, I'm not, I'm not taking away any of your problems. I'm helping you understand that you are powerful. You have every answer to every question. And I will help you learn a practice, learn a process, a tool that you can use in your most darkest, most despairing times or in your most elated, beautiful, blissful times. So those are the things that keep me going. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the fact that there's a understanding that while as a solopreneur, you realize that sometimes you're, you, the notion that I'm alone is, does not really need to occur. If, and I don't mean to sound arrogant there, but it's easy to feel like, oh, I'm alone. And I'm, I often talk about connecting, connecting mm -hmm. with other humans. That is very vital because we're all yeah. energetic souls. Yeah, huge. However, when you meditate, I feel like, you know, I don't have like a huge network of friends, but I, I don't feel like I'm lonely. Right. I love that. Um, and to expound on that, uh, I love that because that is one of the things I think about when I think of people who are suffering, when people who are have the perception that they are lonely or that they are alone. Because in my meditation, sometimes my pr more profound ones, I'm like, when I silence myself, when I'm sitting in stillness, I'm like, I am one man here on this bench looking over a soccer field. And yet I feel connected to absolutely every living and even sometimes in, uh, inanimate things, this entire world, this entire universe, I am connected to it. And knowing that I can feel that uh, helps me 
teach again to help people know i'm like you could be my mom used to say you could be alone and lonely in the middle of a party if that's your mindset if you feel disconnected and she said conversely you will never be alone as long as you know that you are part of everything uh so that helps and connection is absolutely vital because um, as much as I tell dad, I'm 50, 50, uh, I hate to, <laughs> hate to break it to him. I'm more 70, 30. Cause I just need to be with people. And I just love connecting with people, whether it be verbally, non-verbally smiling, just exuding the energy that I am soaking up the energy of other people. It's just, uh, yeah. Connection is where it's at for sure. Um, yeah, I often feel like just something as simple as a smile that kind of really lights me up. Like when I Huge. go to a store and people know me there. I Most of the time I'm alone at home. My husband and I work from home, but just seeing that my, my own child smile at me, that's lovely. Yeah, absolutely. My mom used to say, uh, uh, she's like, uh, see if you can uh, borrow somebody's smile. And that was her way of saying, she's like, smile to the world and see if you can get somebody else to smile. And uh, as Pollyannish as it may seem, it's it's beautiful. And to your point, if I see somebody going into the supermarket and I'm just smile and I just smile at them and their face is kind of like worried or they're looking down and they just look up and I smile and they're like, and the, the face just starts to light up. I'm like, sweet, nice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And speaking of connections, one of the things that you and I have in common, which is really why we're here today. One of the reasons at least is that through podcasting, the power of connecting through what I feel like positive messages. Yes, yeah, indeed. And it's not delusional. And we, we realize that there's challenges. Oh, yeah. But, one of the things, yeah. not, to, not to cut you off, I remember telling uh, when my st show started about 10 years ago, uh, I remember my mom was still alive and I went down to visit my mom and dad. And uh, I, I think it was either, I think it was the, it was probably the second day of my show. I remember logging on to uh, the host and I'm like, I'm like, mom, you are not going to believe this. Five people listen to my show. Five people listen to my show. I cannot. <laughs> yeah. And th that's so profound. I mean, as you, you realize that podcasting does require tremendous discipline mm -hmm. and believing in yourself. And sometimes you just don't know if somebody's listening to you. And if they're receiving the value that you hope they can receive. Yeah. And to that point, one of the things that has helped me immeasurably in my podcasting journey is to let go of the metrics. Like way back in the day, I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to monetize this. This is going to be my, my source of income. I'm like, I've got a message, but I want this to be the way that I, I live. So I'm like, follow people. I'm like, cool. How do people that are, you know, like the Lewis Howes, the John Lee Dumas, I'm like, okay, what are they doing? Got to do that. And for a couple of years, I did that. And then for what well, it must have been a meditation, I'm thinking uh, at some point, either Bart or one of my guides said, is that you? I'm like, no. They're like, why do you podcast? I'm like, so I can change somebody's life. Do you need to change a million people's lives? I'm like, no. I'm like, I just have to change as many people as are on the path to being changed. I'm like, when or if it comes that I'm getting 100,000 downloads a month, cool. If it happens, fantastic. If it doesn't, fantastic. I'm still changing the world, and that's all I need to do. Quality over quantities. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Well, Tom, what a pleasure this was. Any, oh, And I definitely look forward to having you back because I've truly – enjoyed our conversation there's like 20 Me things too. you and i can go deeper on <laughs> yeah i have a feeling we have a lot to talk about so yeah. and uh you'll be joining me on my show on zen commuter for sure so we can continue a conversation as well so but i have enjoyed this time today immeasurably me too me too absolutely any uh parting wisdoms on just the overall um topic of being present through crafting your story and understanding your soulful journey yeah, I mean that's as a, as a an ending statement or fact or thought. There could be anything. <clears throat> excuse me, you could go anywhere. But I would imagine that the things that most want people to understand is that when we are rooted in this moment, and maybe we talked about it on the air, off air, but 
this world is so beautiful and yet it is invisible to so many people because their minds are so far in the future about worries or goals or and it's good to have goals obviously but you got to have that balance or maybe their minds are in the past about regrets and they're just either in the future or in the past and this whole beautiful world that's right in front of us becomes invisible so the mind becoming mindfulness whenever we can is definitely going to be in our best interest mm -hmm. the other thing to know too whether it be mindfulness or just meditation is that we talked about it today it's like you are never alone there might be times that you feel despairing, dark. That's your mind trying to talk and not to discredit whatever you're going through, but always know that you are never alone. You are always safe. You are always protected and you have all the answers to any question about yourself that you could ever ask. Trust in yourself, turn inwardly and know that that font of wisdom and joy exists in all of us. I just got chills when you said that and I mean in a good way just it really we all need to hear it sometimes even if you're a practitioner like I am mm. and I probably say this to others but sometimes it coming from another fellow practitioner just reinforces that you're you're safe yeah yeah and that yeah. that can't be understated I mean think about all the ways that our society says yeah you need to be afraid you need to be very afraid I'm like no this this will go away. I'll either get another one or I'll be transcend humanist and go into light and become nothing but love like my mom is right now. So it's all good. On some level, we're all immortal. <laughs> yeah, the human aspect. But yeah, yeah, this is going to go away. The skin, the body, it'll go away. <laughs> but mm -hmm. the energy that is us will never uh, be diminished or go away. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I sincerely really look forward to our future um, conversations. We should definitely um, discuss deeper, but for today, I'm just uh, saying goodbye. And um, thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate you. Oh, uh, right back at Shilpa. It was just absolutely beautiful. And it's not goodbye, it's see you later. <laughs> see you later. Well, have a really wonderful day. Thanks, you too. Take care. Bye.